help put this together, but I'm a small part of the team. Uh, let me just introduce two or three people here that you should see a lot of over the next few weeks. This gentleman here is Ivan. If Ivan hadn't put all the effort in to this, this would not have happened. Uh, these two guys come very, very close second. I look whether Danielle and Diane are here. They're probably busy organising something in the background. But these three guys here are the ones that have really put this summer school together. So uh, if you see them walking around looking lost, just hold their hand and move them on to all the over very, very soon. <laughs> uh, so this is the Intercontinental Summer School on Renewable and Sustainable Energy. It's the first one in Boulder, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, the first one in Boulder. It won't be the last. Uh, so there'll be another group of you here next year. Probably it's not the same people. Um, I understand that we have sent our offers to people from 36 different countries. I think every continent apart from Antarctica is represented. Uh, we have 13 speakers from overseas. You'll be delighted to know that there are about just over 120 tutorials over the next few weeks. Uh, eight public lectures, of which this is the first public lecture. And then four panels that you'll have to enjoy. And then if that's not enough, we're going to have a workshop at the end of that where we'll have another 30 more talks, some of which are slightly shorter. The uh, program is made up into four parts. This is the first part, which is the overview. We'll start about a week. And then we have the tutorials on organic PV and nano and emerging PV. And then the, the nano PV workshop is, is when we actually finish uh, in a few Saturdays from now. So that's a basic overview of, of what's going to happen. Yvonne will probably tell you a lot more about the nitty gritty details tomorrow morning. Uh, but let me introduce our first speaker, the first public speakers. I mean, Boulder have been told about this presentation as they have all the other public uh, seminars. Uh, Kaz is a good person to start with. I've heard so many good things about this man's lectures, but yet I've never heard him speak, so hopefully everyone has not been misled me. <laughs> so, so Kaz actually got his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD from a place that the French will shudder when I say this. This is from Notre Dame. Uh, Notre Dame if you're French, Notre Dame if you're from Indiana. Uh, he then spent six or seven years at the University of Maine, and became the first staff member of the National Renewable Energy Lab. In fact, in those days, it was called the Solar Energy Research in, Institute. In photovoltaics, that, that was very first. With your, your like baby. Eight. So. Your little piece of paper said the first. Yeah, you didn't read this next slide. <laughs> so, That's really, I didn't read my, 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 my notes before I came here. Uh, he served, I think he's probably the most distinguished director of the National Centre for Photovoltaics. He served in that position for almost 10 years. Uh, he is now got well, a number of positions at NRL, and I won't even begin to start telling you all about those. Uh, I, know, I tried to jot down how many medals and prizes he's got. The IEEE, the ABS, the APS, he's had medals and he's a fellow of all of them. He's a fellow of the American Solar Energy Society. And very importantly, and this is the last sentence on his little resume, he's, he, I think he was the first member of the National Academy of Engineering in Edinburgh. Okay. And that's the last thing he put on my resume, that would be the first thing. <laughs> so, um, some funny stories about Kaz. Um, I asked around, uh, he likes designing ties. I believe he's wearing one at the moment. He likes, he likes graphic art. And also, he was the first one in this room wearing the tie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did think about it. Uh, he, um, he was the first person at Edinburgh to bring in a Mac. And he had a portable Mac, and it weighed about 30 pounds, uh, I understand. Uh, he, uh, he has evolved from being quite eloquent in his lectures and using graphics to lots of videos. And so I think you're in for a treat. Uh, I'm not going to take up any more of his time. Um, so I'll hand over to Kaz. His microphone's on. He's already interrupted me. So I'll hand over to Kaz. And Keep us off. Well, don't go away since you brought this up on the whole thing is that I, I noticed I was looking through the web, okay, uh, this afternoon especially to see about Gary because uh, especially since he introduced this about ties and I was actually able to find this on there. <laughs> 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 So, you know, and I think that tie is really quite good, good on that area. <laughs> so, what I did is, is I think that this, you should really wear this. <laughs> and 
my only worry is, is I'll check tomorrow to see if it's on eBay because uh, sometimes that happens after I give someone a cut. So you should have this great. Well, you know, when I talk to Gary, I don't want to show like this, so maybe I'll take this down. And uh, I asked him what I should talk about. So how many people here work in photovoltaics? Yeah, and that's what he told me. He says, most everybody knows everything about photovoltaics already. So if you're starting off, you might want to talk about something else or really give maybe a little bit more sophisticated lecture on photovoltaics. He said, because this is a very, very, uh, a very, very uh, researching audience and, and they know everything and know all the literature and everything and you might want to make it a little bit more technical. So that's what I did. So I went in there and, uh, and changed the title of this a little bit to make it more appropriate for this audience. <laughs> Well, I'm glad someone's laughing because if I show this to the Department of Energy, they start taking notes okay, on this and, and coming up with programs uh, on this. But, you know, two things you'll have to see. That it's really terrible if you get introduced by someone from, from, from England. Because, you know, when these English guys talk, they always, don't they always sound like they're, they're, they're just so knowledgeable and smart and everything? So I made this title, and you can, if you read it along, you'll see a whilst in there for you, Gary. Kind of second from the last line to make it sound a little bit better. But if you look at this, you'll see a lot of words in here that if you look at the literature, especially if you look at, at a lot of the trade stuff in portable takes, you'll see, you'll see these terms all over on this. It's, you know, quantum this and nano that and and, uh, and uh, multiple exciton this and, and photon recycling. You know, the damn thing, it's all the stuff that you're working on, I think, in this room, okay? Most of the, most of the things, it's probably where there's going to be a Nobel Prize, by the way, in photovoltaics coming out of this stuff. But I put this up there for another reason, okay? Uh, it's not only to point out that this stuff is going on, but to also to point out that photovoltaics is also real. And sometimes people think that, uh, that photovoltaics is always going to be the next generation of things. And if we always do that, we're never going to use it. And I'm going to go through this thing and point out that photovoltaics is real right now. But hey, we need all of this. Because when, when, when our next generations of people get going, if these things aren't there, we're not going to be ready with these energy sources. I, a second or third reason I've done this is how many, anybody here when you start up his or her own photovoltaic company on this, on this? See, and, and the idea is, is that there still is a lot of money to do this from, from private sources. There has been a lot of money from venture capital, and still is venture capital, as I found out last week, venture capital money out there. So you can still do this. So what I've done is anyone who wants to start up a PD company, I've made it easy. So I've taken all these words, okay, and I've put them into these two columns for you so that you can actually take this and, and you can name your own photovoltaic company. For instance, <laughs> you could call it uh, maybe something like SunTech, all right, but that's already been taken. Uh, okay. Or if you really want to get out, is maybe you can call it First Solar. That's been taken. You can call it Nano Solar. How many physicists are here? So there are some forbidden, forbidden transformations in here on this. If you look at it, if you start a company in photovoltaics, I wouldn't call it something like Nano Power because this is not an image that you really want for for yourself. And there are some other things you might want to avoid now, too. Maybe something like <laughs> So how many people here have heard about Solyndra? Really? So I think maybe the people, I, I found out that most audiences have heard of this company. And if you, if you follow the US election, you could have heard about it all weekend. I mean, the press had a, had a big thing. That, big argument about Solyndra. Yes, it wasn't an argument, it was just statements how bad the administration has done because of Solyndra. I mean, it's a whole big thing on this. It's, it's so that this is probably a name that you shouldn't choose on the whole thing. But if you look at this whole thing and look back, 
this is a company that got a loan guarantee of, uh, of uh, $535 million and it defaulted on that. And, and the stuff really started, uh, started off uh, the loan guarantee in 2007. And when they started to designate this $535 million, it was about, uh, about two days of the Iraq War in, in uh, 2007 to give you some idea of how much money that is. But it was a lot of money into this whole thing. So does anyone know what Slinter made on this? Uh, I carry this around now. I don't, I don't play the guitar <laughs> on this, but uh, so this is Slinter's product. It's a uh, photovoltaic product. If I ask an audience of people who aren't technical, they know that Cylindra is in trouble because of a loan guarantee, and it's something sold. And, and then it's bad after that. Everything is bad. But they don't, at least they don't know it's photovoltaics. So this is what Cylindra made. All right? And that's why the name Cylindra, because the thing looks like a cylinder. So it's a, uh, a solar cell that's copper and cell solenoid that's deposited on a cylinder that's actually on the inside of this. And I think if this stuff all made it through, uh, yeah, everything okay. This is one that was broken by TSA on this, and, uh, and so I, I have the pieces of this. But here is the inner cylinder that has the copper and the selenite deposited on it. It won't come off anymore in the glass, but it has this with a plastic thing around it. On this, so they deposit the copper and the selenite uh, semiconductor on the cylinder and put it in there, and then they encapsulate it, and they encapsulate it the same way that a fluorescent light bulb is. And in fact, the first people they hired in this whole thing were people from, from the fluorescent light thing to be able to encapsulate these uh, these uh, cylinders, and they have one contact in this end, one just like a light, sets in the thing, you have a bunch of these in a row, okay, so they can collect the light as it's coming this way, and on the other side, it sits on a roof that has a white surface on it. So it's a white roof, so they collect from both sides. This particular cylinder was measured at NREL at 21.5% efficiency. 21.5% measuring it from both sides like that. So they put the white stuff down, they illuminate it from this side, so they came out 21%. So how could anything that has such a great efficiency ever fail? How could anything uh, that comes along like that ever, ever uh, have a problem? I mean, the efficiency is great. The, the automation in this plant, if you see it, is incredible. They put these things in, nothing is handed by hand at all. Or I know the cylinders feed in, everything comes out to put it, they get placed in these things automatically. The whole thing automated. Uh, on just what you would want for a factory. Well, what happened is, let's see if it's still going here, this bankability. And it's something if you start a company, worry about right away. It's the capacity to manufacture and produce a product competitively. That is, with, a, with a, an acceptable product. And Solyndra was never, even if China didn't come into the picture, that did affect it, even if they didn't come in, that product was so expensive to manufacture, they could never make a profit on it. And that's what killed it, and that's what's killed several photovoltaic products already. This is not the only one. There have been some other ones. This one has obviously has made the news because it got a lot of money from the U.S. government. This loan guarantee, they defaulted. But otherwise, it worked great. It's all automated. They can put the stuff out. But the major reason was it was too expensive to manufacture. So when you get your company, make sure that uh, you can do it. There are lots of thin film companies out there with those names that you saw from that very, very first slide. Okay, but there's starting to be a uh, thinning of the herd. People are starting to go away, partially because of what happened to Slyndra, but a lot of what we're going to talk about what happened, what happened in, in Asia on the whole thing. So we'll get to that as we go along. 
Now, I, I, every time I do this, someone says that they didn't know that First Solar went out of business. Well, First Solar didn't go out of business for the product that they make. They make cadmium telluride solar cells. Their copper and gallium selenide startup that they were working on, they stopped because, because they couldn't make the investment anymore in order to be able to compete with their uh, current product. We might see it come back. But anyway, those are some people who aren't, just aren't here anymore right now. Some very, very good companies are listed among those. But there's still a lot of other ones. And if you look at these thin film technologies and look at the amount of venture capital that came in through 2010, 2008, it was about a billion dollars of, of uh, U.S. venture capital money being invested in these thin film companies alone. A billion dollars. That was four times the amount that came, that was being uh, supported by the U.S. government in all photovoltaics, and this is only in thin films. And last year, in 2011, it was something less than a half a billion dollars still, and a lot of money now is not coming from the U.S. A lot of the money that's being invested in these companies in copper, new selenite, and these other thin films is coming from Asia. So not only are photovoltaics being produced there, as we'll see in a little while, but also the money is coming from that side. Well, I used to give this talk several years ago and call it Photovoltaics at the Tipping Point. All right, uh, this book by Malcolm Gladwell, if you haven't read it, read it. It's really a kick to read it. He talks about different products. Been, and he defines the tipping point as that magic moment where I, when an idea, trend, or behavior crosses a threshold, tips and spreads like wildfire. And that's where Photovoltaics was about uh, five years ago. It's no longer then, but then Malcolm Gladwell, I thought he should write a book called Beyond the Tipping Point, but he never did. But he did write outliers, which kind of define technologies and other things that are, are, are kind of uh, situated or classified differently from a related body. And that's where a lot of the renewables have been. They've been called alternate energy. And I hate that term because they're real energy sources. They're not alternate energy sources that are real. But maybe now, as I heard last week, is you have to go to Charles Dickens' book. I, I was at Inner Solar last week, and this is kind of how it is. It's kind of the, the best of times and the worst of times right now. Total takes, markets are continuing to grow, and, and they, I mean, every year their stuff is going up, and, and we're gonna see that. The installations, the sales, everything. The thing is, is that that countries like the United States are losing market share, continuing to lose market share in this whole thing. I don't think that's really bad. People ask me, well, what do you think of China? And I tell them that as a consumer, I say, God bless China for this because it's made photovoltaics for me very affordable, all right? But maybe if I was an industry person in here or in, in Europe or something, I might, I might feel a little bit uneasy with that statement and certainly if I'm working on some of these new technologies that we absolutely need, I, I would be not very happy right now either. So. Anyway, uh, so it's no, like, no longer an outlier. I'm going to talk about that. And I'll talk about some history, myths, and the reality of uh, photovoltaics as part of the solar energy. I'll talk some technology in here as we go along. And then even in the best of times and worst of times, it's still good and it's going to continue to be, uh, be good for this technology. I have some messages in here. You'll have to pick them up yourself. First, that photovoltaics is real. Not only the future now. Uh, last year was about, a, about an $85 billion industry worldwide. $85 billion. It's no longer just a niche-type market of the whole thing that is kind of a myth we've heard that only serves toys and small applications starting to serve real energy markets. It's nowhere near where it should be or could be, but it's starting to do that. And people are making money on this technology. We need both an investment in policy and R&D. Both are important. Policy is important because policy, by the way, is, is one way to say 
Subsidies is another one. We don't have subsidies in our thing like Europe with the fee and tariff or some of the stuff we have here in Colorado with RPSs and things like this. Without that, this technology is this too expensive for us to afford. And, and then no one will buy it. But if you subsidize it like that, us as consumers that can afford to invest in it, we buy the stuff so then, so then that the uh, people who make the stuff can make more, and then the price comes down, their capacities can go up, and the price comes down by the economies of scale. But no matter what you do with the current technologies, they're never going to make it all the way unless you have an investment in research. Unless, first of all, you do something on the research side to bring down the costs further. It can't just do it by, by economies of scale. And secondly, uh, you have to do something to bring around the next generation of technologies as well. We have to drastically shorten the time that from discovery, okay, till it's used. Boy, it just still takes too long uh, to get the stuff out, out to, to the market. I was with Dick, uh, Dick Swanson, who was at SunPower. That solar cell that he uh, brought into SunPower now is being manufactured. He first reported in uh, 1982 or 1983, pushed to try to get people to do it. And it wasn't until 2002 or 2003 till that became a commercial viability. That's just too long for us working on this to have stuff really come out and be used. We have to significantly increase the workforce. I was very surprised last week at InterSolar on, on that meeting of the number of jobs that are posted in this and the cry for more people to be educated in photovoltaics to hire people. That they want people. There are jobs available right now, and, uh, and the demand is, is still there. So at least if you're working in this, you know that there's something. So the myth that there are no jobs, no business development, there is. Uh, and we need a balanced R&D portfolio. We can't just look at near-term things. We also have to invent, have an investment in longer-term things because they have to be ready when the people who need to need those things uh, uh, are ready to use it, so they're ready for that. So whether it's our grandchildren, our grandchildren's grandchildren, to make them available, we have to start working now. Well, I showed this to Gary, and he told me that's great, but these guys have seen lots of PowerPoint presentations in their lives, and, and uh, uh, they do all that stuff anyway, again, and he says, Maybe what you can do is do something a little bit different, right? Start to this whole thing. So he suggested I go back and, and do something. So I, I did. Hope this works. So let me see if, uh, if this is. So this is kind of the last 50 years of photovoltaics, the present, and then maybe the next 50 years. I'll look at the whole thing.
Day and, and Sean can answer this thing over there. Does anybody know who this is? Why he's in there. So you can get a hint maybe from the music. Right. Did you hear it at all? They didn't even know what the name of 
that, that satellite was up there. It was not even, and you can see that, that the Russians or actually the Soviets at the time were all using IBM computers. <laughs> I thought that was uh, pretty nice of them. All day. So this whole thing came up there, and it, and it really scared the hell out of the United States. Uh, it would, came kind of unexpectedly. We know that the Russians were going to launch something, but we certainly thought we were going to beat them. Uh, to this, and it really showed that they were uh, ahead of us. And there's a, that's what Sputnik looked like. It was a globe about this big around on this whole thing. And uh, in fact, I think here's someone working on one. On this, you can see what the size is. There's the announcement in the uh, New York Times um, on it. And it was really what the Secretary of Energy calls our Sputnik moment. But it scared a lot of people into science and technology. It's the same thing that, that our energy stuff should be doing now, scaring people into, into science and technology in order to be able to, uh, to solve these problems. In fact, in the, in the uh, moonshot that took place uh, in the 1960s, the average age of the people working on, on that thing were engineers and scientists were 20, 28 years old. And that's pretty incredible. In that short time, these were all people who got scared into the science and technology in the late 1950s. Well, I'm going to take this one step further because right after that, a couple satellites went up, and there was one satellite that, that went up that, that was very near and dear to the uh, ideas of Arthur C. Clarke, not for the communications point of view, but uh, for some other things. So this thing went up, and it was different than all the other satellites in the fact that it was solar powered. It was the first solar powered satellite, and did two things. It got a whole new way of powering satellites from space, and brought out a whole new industry, the solar uh, PV industry, you know, first in the United States, and then in the rest of the world. Now, when the people who did this, this was done from the project lead on this were naval research labs. When they did this, uh, they did not want to put solar cells on it because solar cells were a new technology four years before really coming out of Bell Labs. And they didn't want to do this because they want something that really worked. So the primary source on this whole thing in order to power this, uh, this transmitter that was on the inside was, were batteries. Good, reliable batteries. And they launched this thing up there, and for the first two weeks, it ran off of that battery very reliably. Then the batteries died. And, and then the solar cells took over. And as I said, those people who were in charge of the project thought that these things, they didn't know whether the solar cells would work. First of all, secondly, they knew that they wouldn't work very long. 
and when they put this up, so there's Hoffman, the guy who made the solar cells, the only company, by the way, at the time. Their complete uh, manufacturing capacity for that year was, a, was something less than 10 watts photovoltaics uh, on the whole thing, so that it was not, not a whole lot. But they did this thing, and they put this thing up, and for the, about the next seven years off of those solar cells, it gave us this constant beep, 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 high up that frequency because they thought those solar cells wouldn't last. They made no provision to turn off the power. So it was the first demonstration, okay, of reliability for this technology, and that's one thing you have to know. Photovoltaics is a reliable technology. There are many, many cases of, of uh, showing that it's reliable on the whole thing. So, and, and as a matter of fact, the people at Hoffman at the same time decided that they would come out with a consumer product. Um, and they came out with this. I can't show this to Art to see if you can recognize it, but <laughs> do, you, do you know what this is? You have no idea. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's called a radio. <laughs> so, so you guys, this was the original iPod. <laughs> I got really excited, by the way, when I got invited here, because I saw that this was iCamp, and I thought that this was put on by Apple, and we did the iPhones, and the whole thing, and it turns out we get none of this, unfortunately. But this was the first commercial put out in 1958. Okay, you can see the solar cells on top. There weren't even rechargeable batteries then, so that it was digital electronics. You had to use your finger your digit on here to switch it between the battery <laughs> and the photovoltaics on this, on this. The problem was the solar cells were just too expensive. So you know, the radio maybe at that time the manufacturing the radio cost five or six dollars. And the solar cells at that time were approaching about a thousand dollars a watt. And so <laughs> this radio radio? It it, uh, it it is not. It is a uh, it is a uh, I can prove it. You can say uh, I have a prototype here in this thing, and it's a film company out of Chicago. So if you look at this thing, on this, these are actually the same solar cells on the prototype. You can pass this around and look inside. The prototype doesn't work anymore, but this radio still does. It's 58 years old, or whatever that that thing is, or 54 years old, and it still works. That's pretty incredible. We can see out here uh, the stuff comes on. It, the the on-off switch is broken because the people at TSA uh, got this and they, they, it's the only thing they ask. You know, I go through security back and all over the world with this stuff and they never ask about the satellite. <laughs> the damn thing looks like a mine. <laughs> and they don't ask about the two, you know, it looks like a pipe bomb. On this, never, never anything that, but the radio, no one knows what a radio is, and they say, what's that? And I have to tell them it's the original iPod. So, so the switch is broken, but the radio still, still does work. So, you know, the technology is there, it's reliable, and obviously I'm not going to make it through this whole electric area, but whenever I get close up there, I'll stop. So, this is what the worldwide production has looked for. As I said, that when they did the stuff for, for this, it was about somewhere less than 10 watts of production at this time. In 2011, they, uh, it was about 33 gigawatts of PV that was manufactured in the world. So that's a long way from what they did for this satellite here. Uh, this, this is all, most of this is going into, is going into terrestrial applications. It's not enough yet, but 33 gigawatts in a year is not too bad. It depends who measures these things. Some people thought it was close 37. Some people reported a little bit less, but, but the growth rates are still about 30%. Next year, it's going to be the same thing. You know, 2011 was a, was a terrible year economically, and, uh, and the stuff went up. And the same thing will happen in 2012 because the markets are still there supporting this uh, stuff. Well, I'm going to skip that. They are putting in big stuff here in the U.S. There are markets in the U.S. There's a myth that says the U.S. is doing nothing in solar. The government is doing very little in solar, the, the national, but the states are doing something in 
solar. So the two biggest states for solar uh, applications are California and New Jersey. That's kind of on the two coasts of the whole thing. So this map is now a couple of years old. Now it will be really much more crowded. Those are showing just spots where there's one megawatt or larger installation, not homes, not a couple kilowatts or four kilowatts or five kilowatts on your house, but pretty big installations. You know, if you anybody here from Japan, I, I uh, always like to, speak, to show this because some Japanese gave me these are some houses that are actually in Fukushima that after the earthquake and tsunami, their houses actually still worked on the photovoltaics that was installed on them, even though they had no power from the nuclear plants coming in, no power from anything, all the lines were down, they still could get power from their photovoltaics on, on that, even in those worst conditions. So where, where is all this PV coming from? I think I've already told you it's not going to be the United States on this. If you look at this in 2010, Something uh, about 45%, uh, 42%, 43% came from China. If you looked in 2006, almost nothing came from China. So the big growth in this industry in China grew up from 2006 all the way through uh, 2010 and all of a sudden started to dominate the world on this. Uh, in 2011, it looked like this. And if you, if you look through it, you can see the major part of that is coming from China, about 47%, I'm sorry, 57% from China. And in fact, I think to be truthful, you can see the United States there in that nice brief. I think, you know, China owns us anyway, so I think that that could be that. <laughs> so all that came from, from China on that, on that. And if you look at this whole thing and see what these percentages are, you go through this whole thing, Turns out that 85% of the photovoltaics came from Asia last year. 85% of the PV came from Asia. And I was all happy that I used to show this and show that in the top 10, all right, eight of the top 10 were Asian, com Asian uh, 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 companies on, on the whole thing. Suntech, China, JA, China, uh, Ying Li, China, Trina, China, Motec, uh, Taiwan, China. Canadian solar, hey, China. <laughs> the guy who was educated in Canada named the Sam Company after that, but he's still in China. Uh, Haryan is in Korea and Jintak is in India too. So you look at that, and eight out of the ten are from Asia. And then look a little closer at this. Those other two companies are called US companies. First solar on this, they manufactured most of their stuff in. Malaysia on this, uh, uh, and, and, and so that's Asia. And, and then Sun Power manufactures everything in the Philippines and Malaysia. So in fact, the top 10 are all made in, in Asia. So that the US, if you want to look at it, or Europe, it really has lost the manufacturing side of the whole thing. Uh, so it's kind of now the China syndrome, on this, truly. Well, where's it all going? Right on this. Well, in 2010, it looked like like uh, like this, where uh, Germany was the major market in, in photovoltaics, with about a cumulative installation of about 17 gigawatts put in in Germany. And if you look at the next nine markets in the world, all right, they don't even add up. To, and still, Germany is bigger than the sum of the next nine on the whole thing. And it's pretty incredible on the whole thing if you look at solar resource. So there's the United States over on this end with all this great solar resource all up in here. And here's Germany. Okay, with the solar it's pretty resource. Cold there. Just, what? I just got uh, here from there. It's pretty cold there. <laughs> the solar cells work better at colder well, temperatures. <laughs> So we have the same solar resources, Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> and as we in the United States know, you can, you can see Russia from there. <laughs> so, so this is pretty, and, and if you look at all the growing markets that we're starting to see, they, you know, people say there's just not enough solar resource. You know, but it makes sense for Germany. It shows how stupid we are here in the United States. It makes sense here, big time. 
and other countries. Brazil, we're starting to do some stuff in there. Uh, and if you look at how much power it takes, that little square here is uh, the area you, you would need if you installed the photovoltaics up there, took in, into account the capacity factor and everything to completely replace the current uh, generation capacity about somewhere around a terawatt of generation capacity in the U.S. Or in Brazil, okay, and they always say solar is too diffuse, takes too much area. That area is not a lot. And for India, we we'll put up India too. So that you can go up there in, in Rajasthan and the, the Tar Desert, uh, which also has another problem for photovoltaics. A lot of the big growing uh, markets uh, for photovoltaics, like in the Middle East, where people have enough to invest in this stuff, they have a big dust problem. As, as they do in the Tar Desert, which is a place that they're going to be putting a lot of uh, solar. So that's where it's going. It's mainly putting into grid-connected applications. It's kind of too bad where it's needed mostly is in those applica applications for people who have no grid. But it turns out that for the people who, mo who can most afford it, don't have the money to afford it. On this. They, make, they may just make sense technically and economically to go to those places that don't have a grid, but the people who can afford it are the people in the developed countries, and we're buying it. Germany's buying it, the United States, Spain, and it's going into those markets first. All kind of that. Let me look at some technologies on these pathways. And I, I like to show this because I think it's a good application of, of eco. I started keeping this chart in about 1983 or 1984. This shows the best research cell efficiencies of all these technologies. And so this was really great. And about two years ago now, this publication called Green, Green Energy, uh, which is one of those internet things, picked this as one of the top 10 renewable energy, not only is PD, top 10 renewable energy slides. And they picked it as the slide that anyone who talks about photovoltaics should use. And that's like, oh, this is great about this whole thing. Two weeks later, this organization called Golden Quill, and it's a media organization, picked this as the worst PowerPoint slide they've ever seen in their lives. So, <laughs> so the fame, fame sometimes goes away, but it does have a, have a, a reason for looking at this, if you see this really has a diversity of technologies from things that are, are kind of emerging down here that we're going to see up in these ranges, okay, as we go along on this whole stuff. And also some established technologies that are there, both in the thin films and crystal and silver. I think it's one of the strengths that photovoltaics has is that we do have a, a great deal of viable approaches, and there's no decision made yet on any one of these as the winner. And as I kind of said before, is I, I always think that it's down here where we're going to see a Nobel Prize coming in photovoltaics. That eventually that that's what's going to be the thing that's going to win over uh, as we go along. So I didn't say that right. I'm never quoted on that. Anyway, so, so this, these are all the efficiencies. So we have all this thing. And if you look at these things, and I'll, I'll just do this very quickly and then end it here before we get to the top of the hour is that we've been kind of going on an accelerated evolutionary. I mean, these are technologies that are kind of in this five-year time frame. Mainly, mainly these things like, uh, like this, what we have now, crystal and silver. So these solar cells have, are, are the, you know, 85% of what's, what was installed last year was this, technologies that were like Typically, with efficiencies in the cell side, it's someplace between 15% up to about 23% uh, off the commercial line on the whole thing. So this is this is what we've been uh, playing, and and these have been evolutionary and on the whole thing because they've been following this learning curve that's been called an 80% learning curve. That means every time that the cumulative production in the world doubles that the price for that product, in this case, this photovoltaic module, the price, not the cost, the price comes down by 20%. And it's been kind of following that for, for uh, quite a while on, on the whole thing, until China came in. And in this last two years, the prices have been falling considerably. If you could read that, you could actually buy modules now 
really first rate with top class modules from China at 80 to 85 cents a watt. Remember that these things back in 1958 were, were uh, somewhere near $1,000 a watt. And now you're buying these at, at 85 cents a watt. Real, these are modules, the cells are with that, that, that. These are whole modules that you can buy. Three years ago, you were paying, you were paying probably two and a half to three dollars a lot for those modules. Something is happening in China to make that come down, and there's a lot of stuff you can talk about. So there is a myth that cost is 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 a major impediment. It is an impediment, but but things are starting to look better on the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to skip through on the whole thing. In 2012. We're probably going to be sitting someplace down about here for the price of this module, someplace in that region. Not enough yet. And also, now that the tariff is being put through in the U.S., it's going to, there's going to be a tariff put it through in Europe on the whole thing. I think eventually what's going to happen is that Chinese manufacturers have been receiving a, a bit of help from the government. Say it's brought down the, brought down the, the, the prices that we pay. And I think that the manufacturers themselves are going to regulate themselves in China because their margins have gone, gone bad as well. So they're going to regulate themselves in the place to bring it back up to where it should be. Uh, this has been the major thing. As I said, silicon has looked, looked like this as, as we go along. It's been the major technology. And, and if you remember in that curve, there were some bumps in there recently. And that has to do with the, well, just go point out that there, even in silicon, there are some bankability problems. There's one technology, the BP Saturn cell, stopped production because it was too expensive to manufacture. We didn't hear a lot about that. It was in production went along, but they stopped it because it was not inexpensive enough for manufacturing. There are lots of these are all the 20% commercial cells available right now. The cell that comes out of sun power with all the contacts in the back. You can get cells so at about 23.5% now off the commercial line with modules between 20 and 21%. So the technology has come along uh, fairly well. Well, as I said, there was a problem for a while with silicon. It doesn't exist. What I'll do, I think, is just, just tell this story because I thought when I started at NREL, I was a person who could have been a visionary at that time. And, and this is in 1977 is when, I, uh, when I came to the lab. And at that time, as you know, that, that things were starting up, energy was a problem, oil, this was uh, just terrible. You were paying maybe, what, maybe 80 cents a, a, a dollar a gallon for, for gasoline. And we thought that this was just the end of the world at that time, and we invested this stuff. And so Siri started up the Solar Energy Research Institute, which became NREL uh, in 1991. But Siri started up with the idea that we were going to solve all these energy problems. And uh, I was lucky enough to be there at the beginning, and I, I had the first laboratory in, in existence. And, and uh, as a result, anyone who came through there uh, uh, to NREL, whether they were a congressman or anything like that, that they, I got to see them because that was the only thing we had at the time. Um, so they painted, I did surface analysis at that time, a lot of OG electron spectroscopy and things like that. And one afternoon in 1979, Paul Rappaport, came, who was our director at the time, brought me by a reporter from the Rocky Mountain News. And uh, came in there, it was late in the afternoon, about four o'clock, and Rappaport never liked to leave anybody with me alone. And, but he came in and said, hey, listen, could you tell them all this good stuff you're doing with the photovoltaic industry to find out all these things about their materials and help them out so that they get this stuff and make it cheap and everything. And then he said the magic words, and he says, because I have to get back for this meeting with the Saudis. And he took off and left me with the reporter from the Iraqi Health News. So he came there, and I started to tell him, and I told him that, all the stuff that we were doing, bump 
barley samples with these high energy electrons and sampling these OJ electrons that were emitted by this process and showed it to them and then uh, able to tell the composition and the elements that were there. You know, this guy's eyes glazed over and he closed his notebook and kind of went on like that. Finally, he interrupted me and he said, Hey, listen. Uh, Dr. Rappaport said that they had to go back for a meeting with the Saudis. Is anybody here from Saudi Arabia? Great company now, a great country now, investing a lot into PV on this stuff. So anyway, he said, why are the Saudis out here looking at, at solar energy? So I saw my, my, uh, my uh, moment of fame there, and I says, oh, I said, you know, the Saudis aren't dumb. I said, he says, but they have all that oil. He says, they know that the oil is eventually going to disappear. They're not going to have it anymore. And he says, yes. He says, but why solar? I said, well, it's not only solar. It's, it's photovoltaics. And at that time, you know, newspaper men couldn't tell whether photovoltaics was photovoltaics or it was some sort of a birth control instrument at that time. So, so I had a spell it for him. And he said, well, why that? And I said, so I picked up one of these wafers. And I said, listen. This is it. This is a photovoltaic cell. And he said, yes, and now he's copying all this down. I said, you know what this is made of? And he said, no. I said, it's made of silicon. He says, yes. I said, you know where they get silicon? He said, no. I said, sand. And I said, and the Saudis have a lot of sand. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny, too. And, and I took it one step further. And I said, yeah, you know, and I, said, I think they're going to plan to sell it to us for $40 a barrel. <laughs> so he took the stuff and got it and left the laboratory. And I came up the next morning and picked up the Rocky Mountain News. And, and there it was as the, uh, sometime in July of 79, and the covers were always gas oil prices were, were going, going bad and the whole thing and, on this. And I was walking, I can still see myself walking in off of my driveway and then I opened it up to pages two and three, and there it was. <laughs> Saudis foresee solar energy. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, uh, the subtitle, plan to sell stand at $40 a barrel. And I just shrunk. Oh my God. And then I saw here, down here in paragraph two, they, they, they identified the perpetrator. <laughs> still a record that stands at, at, at our laboratory. And that's the record is, is the shortest time ever measured from the time I arrived at Siri that morning until I was called up to the director's office. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was years before they let me out to go talk to anything. <laughs> so it's a really a miracle. You know, you look at that, and then, then I picked up this just in this last April off the web. And there it is, the Germans. Okay. <laughs> Saudis plan to make desert sands into, into solar, solar polysilicon. I mean, I could have told them this in 1979. <laughs> now, now it's reality on the whole thing. And even taking this one, so everyone wants to be Saudi Arabia. Okay, here you have here the America West is the Saudi of solar. I mean, you pick up all these things and you see here, here's Suffolk County in New York is going to be the Saudi Arabia of solar. And, and here inside, I don't know where is this? This is New Mexico is going to be the Saudi Arabia of solar. And you know, like that, here's California, I think, is this Saudi of uh, Arabia of green power. And uh, all of uh, California or something here is uh, the Saudi Arabia of the sun. Or maybe uh, here is, uh, which one is this? This is uh, Australia is going to be the Saudi Arabia of solar. Uh, on this and, 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 and India, okay, is going to be the side. You know, like, like that. Here we have even the Himalayas, uh, <laughs> Saudi Arabian solar. And, and Brazil is going to become the Saudi Arabian solar. And finally, just recently, we found out the real thing that Saudi Arabia is going to be putting in lots of solar power now. And finally, it came out that Saudi Arabia is going to be the solar. So the people who can really afford this whole thing are really going to finally make this investment on this. And let me end it by, by saying here 
that this is where photovoltaics has been. So that all these PV people that we know have always been this person on this side where the, where the periodic table has just been silly. And we have to realize there's more to that periodic table on this. And that's how we're getting into these next, next things, the things that many of you are working on, whether disruptive technologies on this whole thing that can jump us off very, very quickly from that learning curve, or even more important, those revolutionary technologies that can really take us off that curve and make things very, very inexpensive with this technology. And just to give, I think, one example before I turn to look at these things on these disruptive technologies, that these are real. Um, you know, here's uh, copper and selenide, okay, on a, on a foil type, type script. I even think I have here. Uh, I always like this because it kind of gives the military look at this. this is, Copper and selenide on, on, a, on stainless steel. All right, this is about 11% efficient. Each one of these panels on this. This is out of global solar. And this, this, this is about 64 watts. This whole thing. This was made originally by troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. They have these things. I'm going to take it off now. So and use these things to power or to. Uh, uh, power the communication systems, charge batteries, and the whole thing. Uh, and, and if you don't like that, I have, I think, oh yes. So this is copper beam selenide on plastic. And of course, what we want to do is take it to the next generation, is not only do it on plastic, but to make the solar cells out of the plastic. And that's where we are now with many of the organic technologies, that we don't just put it on these substrates, but the, but the organics themselves are the active elements of the solar cells. So let me end this, because um, we're getting near You know, I really should get a real job to figure out that I write every line of this uh, presentation like that. So that's where we were looking at, at these whole things. And let me just end it with this by saying is that many people have said this in the past, you know, that the only thing about the future was that, that, uh, that you couldn't predict was that history didn't know. So I gave a lot of history, okay, building up and looking at the future for these technologies on the whole thing. Or maybe even more than that, it's where most of you sit right now that it's easier to grasp the future if you know what it should look like. And you really are sitting at a point now where all these technologies on, on this energy side are just at the point where you can start controlling things yourself and have real careers that can, can really contribute. Or maybe taking this one step further and saying is the best way to protect the future is to create it. And I hope all of you are part of this whole thing to really create our future on this. So I'm going to end there, but I did do a finale because Gary told me that it made it look like it was far too sensitive. And he told me that he knew I was not that sensitive type of person in the whole thing. So I did a finale on this whole thing. So.
green energy requires a new factor is kind of polluted. So we need to balance the pollution and the sound side. So yeah, what to do with this problem? Yeah, uh, you know, I wrote an article in, in about 2000 or 2001. The uh, seven myths of photovoltaics, I gave some of them here. One of them was something you're kind of talking about, but it is a real concern, is that you, you don't want to have a manufacturing process that does terrible, far more terrible things than this clean energy that you're producing. And, and in reality, the worst that photovoltaics has is, is that that we have for the microelectronics industry. Uh, you know, most of these other technologies, we worry about uh, toxicity of some of these things. But most of the problems we've had now, you probably know some of the problems we had in China where, where there weren't regulations on these companies and there were some really terrible things that happened with, uh, with solvents and some other things that were dumped into rivers and things like that. I think that regulation has to do this. The industry itself has, has been pretty, uh, pretty strong now regulating itself to make sure. So, so whether you're working with, uh, with something like that to make a silicon solar cell, or whether you're making a cadmium telluride solar cell, all those modules now for those technologies are all barcoded, they're tracked, they have recycling uh, processes with them, but it still does not mean that we don't have to have a great deal of care because any kind of an accident is death. Look what Solyndra has done to photovoltaics, and, and that's that's just money. I mean, money is something that has slowed this whole industry. If something happens that is a great, great accident like that, that could be very disastrous. So you're very, very right to be able to uh, look at these things to make sure that those things don't happen. But I would say most of the industry now is very, very uh, concerned about something that could happen like that. It would just be so devastating. There have been some accidents. There have been some people who have been killed in photovoltaics, but there have been people killed in the microelectronics industry as well, far and far more. So I think uh, I think that, that the regulation of these things, the self-regulation right now is very, very important. Does so anyone else have a question at the back? Well, recently I read a new saying, the wind, uh, the, uh, the electricity generated by the wind power actually is getting close to the price that the fire power station generated. So I was wondering at what stage the solar energy can compete even with the wind energy. Yeah, I think there are a couple things with that. Certainly wind is competitive. Many, many, many people think it's competitive now with uh, conventional uh, uh, but, you know, every technology has good points and bad points. And you have to look on, uh, on uh, what the applications are. Wind isn't available everywhere, all right? And many times wind and solar complement each other. If you go down to Texas, where there are huge wind installations down in the United States, and even here in, in, uh, in the Midwest, the wind mainly blows at night. And so it many generates the electricity at night, which complements the solar that might come during the day. So sometimes these technologies do complement each other. Wind is a technology that's in there to make big power. Uh, you you uh, most of the time have large wind machines coming up here. I saw those huge machines sitting out there on, on uh, from the Enrel uh, wind site on the whole thing. So it's usually something that you're talking uh, you're talking installations that have, uh, have uh, several uh, gigawatts, uh, hundreds of, maybe hundreds of gigawatts of that power sitting there. And uh, a lot of solar is distributed energy, so that it competes on the customer side of the meter. Uh, on so if you have it on your rooftop, you're competing with electricity, that, with the price of electricity that you're paying for which might be eight cents or 10 cents or 30 cents a kilowatt hour, depending on when it's generated, not with the generation price. So they compete with different markets. I, I think that, that our energy portfolios as we go forward will have all these in it. You know, the price of photovoltaics has been coming down a lot more rapidly than people had predicted. Uh, and in fact, is anybody here working on concentrated solar power? Already, the price of photovoltaics 
has, has caused some disruptions in what they thought would be big investments in, in solar thermal, these large solar thermal systems. And now in the U.S., several of these large solar thermal systems have been replaced by photovoltaics because of the price of the technology. Is it here yet? No. But is it coming along fast? Yes. And eventually, I think we'll see, uh, we're not going to see wind go away. We're going to see wind continue to grow and be a, a huge part of our energy portfolio. But we'll also see the solar and the PV sides also grow. Um, when is, is uh, PV uh, going to become uh, that? I can only quote right the uh, Secretary of Energy in the United States, right? It'll be 2020, because that's when uh, with this uh, sunshot initiative says that photovoltaics will be down to less than a dollar a watt. On this. So if, if this uh, US program is successful, it'll certainly be the net uh, time span. But in reality, if you go to Brazil right now, the average price for electricity, no matter where you are down there, is about 30 to 35 cents a watt, uh, a, a kilowatt hour. And right now, photovoltaics is actually competitive. And the reason that the price for electricity is, is so much down there, most 85% is, is anyone here from Brazil? 85% no. of their power is done by hydro. And that's really pretty true, cheap. What they do is they tax it. And so they tax it up to this 30 cents a, a kilowatt hour. And at that 30 cents a kilowatt hour, solar could actually, solar could be so it depends where it is. In Los Angeles now, during the summer, on uh, peak times, you know, they pay uh, uh, 40 to 60 cents a kilowatt hour sometimes for the electricity goes, uh, when the demand goes up. So it depends where it is. But you're right. Right now, of the renewables, uh, wind has a, has a real advantage in, in being able to be uh, early and expensive. But we're going to have all these things. We're going to have coal. We're going to oil. This is just me. You know, nuclear is part of our portfolio. And I think what's going to happen is eventually the ones that make sense technically and economically are the ones that will be the major sources. Uh, you mentioned the battery. Last question. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned that battery is the reason why many companies fail. So in terms of that, like, uh, which kind of technology you can predict is going to be winning in like the next 10 years? <laughs> well, right now, silicon is winning. So we know that that's going to continue to win. I think some of the thin film, what's that? Thin film. And I think, I think crystal and silicon will continue to be, be part of this whole thing. It will still be. You know, every time that one of us thin film people make, a, uh, make an improvement and, and come up, the crystal and silicon people always surprise us with something else. <laughs> so that I think that that, that count competition is quite good. I think thin films will come along uh, on this. I really uh, have, a, have a lot of hope for organics on this. I mean, if you, if you look at all the, all the reasons that it should be inexpensive, the only thing that's inhibiting some of this stuff is the ability to make, uh, to make it efficient enough and make it last long enough. And, it, and the progress of this you know, if you look at those curves, you know, whether it's all those technologies are, are, are advancing a lot faster than the, when those early technologies did. And they have so many people working on it. I always think it's a mistake to make uh, technology decisions and say, hey, we're not going to support organic solar cells anymore because I think it's not going to make it. I think uh, what we're seeing now is that sometimes technology catches up with you and you start to understand things. You know, we know more about materials now. We techniques to analyze stuff now that weren't available even five, eight years ago. And I think that's all going to help us push these technologies and make them real. So I think that what are you working on? Uh, thin film silicon. Thin film silicon is the holy grail of, uh, of this. It always has been, as long as I can remember, is that if you could make a, a thin film uh, silicon with the same efficiency as a crystalline silicon, a regular crystalline silicon, you're going to have it because uh, most likely you can do this. You have materials uh, 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 use a uh, kind of
conservation and everything else go. I mean, it always has been the holy grail. You're not talk, talk, you're talking amorphous? Uh, Real silly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, think that, I think that's right. It always has been the holy grail. Hey, listen, we have a lot of silly out there. It's the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So uh, we don't have worries about having to have Earth abundancy but then there are a lot of other technologies we don't worry about either. So I'm sorry to hear that. Organic Smith and Jones. I usually have that by now, so. Not <laughs> work with you. I want to point that out. Okay, well, I think we should thank Kaz once more for a great lecture.